It's Wednesday evening, the 1st of December here at the Tearconnell Tribune with myself, John McAteer, here, Declan Kerr and Eamon McFadden. First day of December, boys, no Christmas decorations up around the place? No, but plenty of Christmas weather. Christmas weather, I've just been out walking Shanna up, up, the, uh, up the lag there in the sleet. What would be the odds of a white Christmas now at that rate? And apparently the odds for a white Christmas are very, very poor. Apparently after next week, the long range forecast was suggested. Weather conditions are going to settle down fairly dramatically, mm. but as of now, for this week, mm. for the rest of the weekend, it's not good. There's no good news at all on the horizon. But you know, we had gales and winds of such a strength last weekend. It's surprising that a lot more damage wasn't done. Mm. Although we had a lot of power outages, outages in different areas of the county. No, I don't know. We don't want to get hit yeah. pretty hard. Mm. Like at the moment, you have Christmas lights being turned on. Uh, we're just looking there at Mary Worskis up at the top of the mountain. Mm. It's switched on above Kerry Keel there. Uh, I think Rathmullen is probably on. Uh, Kilma Cranon is coming on. Mulford here is coming on this weekend. Creasley, Don Fanny. Letter Kenny was on. Mm. Letter That's Kenny is, is already on. on. Yeah. Don Fanny is on. Due to come on, Due to come on this uh, weekend again. And there are various other ones like Churchill and Downing, so we haven't heard from them yet. So, uh, we get a bit of a festive atmosphere from this week on, depending on a whole lot of things. Hmm. Weather, the, the the virus, all that kind of thing. The, hmm. People are at a very low ebb this, uh, this Christmas time. Yeah, you factor the weather and all that together and schools yeah. issues and all that. Yeah. And of course we have this new Omicron virus, one case confirmed in the country already. It may not be quite as serious as it first anticipated, but it's adding to the uncertainty in, in, in the public psyche. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. I suppose with the numbers in general being high, we, I suppose the uncertainty, and hopefully it's not, hopefully the Omicron is, is not too serious, but still it adds to the anxiety and there's so many things. And then we have the issue with the, the schools and the masks now for uh, people from, what is it, from third class up. And, uh, yeah, yeah, people it, have had their fill of it really, but I suppose it's, it's ongoing and it's not, it's yeah. not slowing yeah. down. The figures are still really you know, high. People are in a different place. Uh, I would say confidence in in the handling of COVID itself on a wider scale, not only by government but by NEFIT, but also the messaging that's been coming out of it. Uh, people are no longer getting that message. Now somebody's got to be blamed for that there. Either the group that needs to be reached, uh, is, uh, they're, 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 they're not getting that message for to ensure that they're fully vaccinated, or else that they're obeying the the very basic regulations that are, that are set down there about wearing a mask and social from day distancing one, yeah. from day one, mm -hmm. those things haven't changed and they won't change. Mm -hmm. And uh, avoiding large crowds, mm -hmm. it's not too hard to do that at the moment, man. It's, it's hard to find a small crowd even mm -hmm. because so much stuff is just simply not happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all gone off. But canceled. parents have been speaking to me in the past week and they feel that they are now being targeted by the government has been totally responsible for the well-being of their children mm. because the numbers of children affected is quite, quite high. They're unvaccinated until the new year. Mm. Schools, for staff and parents and everybody else, and for children particularly, and indeed secondary schools, they're very cold, cold places by regulation. Uh, that there are filters in there, that now this HEPA filter uh, from... From the effort team today, it's, it's only suitable for very small spaces. Mm. But you can imagine sitting in school or college a day like this here, yeah. uh, just with your school uniform. No, and how You're going to be frozen. Mm. The whole environment for education, for learning is, I mean, it's, it's kind of secondary with, with to, to what's going on in the actual, you know, in the, the actual classroom in terms of how to, you know, trying to stay warm just, mm -hmm. you know. But you see... A throwback, all right. Why was it in September? the first week back at school, those major concerns, those very high numbers that week, uh, the government will only go with messaging if it's, if it's positive. Mm -hmm. They want to, inf to to reinforce this mantra that uh, schools are safe places. Schools were never safe in so far as the, the, vac or as the virus was concerned. The school environment is, is, is a very important place in, in, in people's lives, right up until the uh, secondary, second level and further into third level and, and, and beyond that into universities. Uh, have they got a raw deal on this? You know, the contact tracing that should have been running in schools and that was stopped. Uh, 
no antigen testing and all this kind of thing. All of that has been left. Everything seemed to hang on the fact that we get numbers of people vaccinated that will create create that kind of a herd immunity yeah. that leaves us all relatively safe. Now, whilst the vaccine is no doubt saving lives, a eh, the vaccine itself is not a guarantee that we that we can halt this thing in yeah. in 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 any quick time. Maybe that messaging was some of the thing that they should have realised maybe earlier on because people did have this thinking it was a you know, almost like a panacea of some kind to just address the issue. But like we're staring into a Christmas as bleak as almost last Christmas. Yeah, was, it was like, more this is the sad part of it. You mm-hmm. see, the reality is that the government wants or wanted it to be on message and with their positivity sort of from last July, August onwards mm. that we were getting on top of the slow rollout of vaccines, uh, which was quite tortuous in the early part of the year because the, the vaccines promised were not being delivered as yeah. they should be. We, we eventually got on top of that at, at the main vaccination centres around the country and they've, they've, they've done a very, very good job. But, you know, vaccination centres, when you look at the crowds that were waiting in those queues, it mm. was at City West last Sunday yeah. for five hours. Mm. That's absolutely incredible. Mm. It's almost yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. 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 You know, that, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, people waiting for booster jobs, others waiting for their first or second job, mm. total confusion outside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you admire the people that actually waited for five hours in the chill weather of uh, late November. Mm. So the government, somewhere along the way, is not getting it right. They're taking control of the messaging as long as it's positive. Just listening to Norma Foley on the news at one today as a case in point that Brian Dobson was trying to get some clarity out of uh, what mask wearing in schools and raising questions that were obviously raised with RTE by the confused thinking. And she said the situation was abundantly clear. And she wanted to emphasise that, but that's all we learned. Mm-hmm. But like that is one thing, track, tracking and tracing, there's no great explanation as to why that was abandoned, mm-hmm. because that did work quite successfully. Yeah. Probably the, the, the government felt that it was probably been, been, been a bit overdone. Okay, you're better safe to go and get the test rather than be sorry and not get it. Mm-hmm. So now we're, we're back to children. You know, they're only allowed one social community activity in the week. And that leading into that Christmas festive season where you're going to have several visits for Santa around every parish and every local event mm-hmm. uh, turning on Christmas lights and plays and so on plays and nativity plays and mm. uh, sleepovers and what if um, yeah. a yeah. visit to church so for service on a Sunday is that a social event mm-hmm. what happens if you take the family to church on a Sunday does that leave them grounded until the following Sunday yeah. We don't know that. For, yeah. pa- for parents, it's, it's very difficult for parents too because there's numbers of little things that are going on and you, if you would start to choose, pick and choose between one ah, and another. It's, micromanaging. It's you see, there's this spirit of Christmas that is just kicking in now from this weekend onwards. And it's, it's the children's time of year. Like it, it is their season. And they'll be at untold events or should be at untold events, be it in their community or a visit to Letter Kenny or to Santa's Grotto. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. all of that now will have to be retaught and probably reconfigured. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely cancelled. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like all the, the little school shows, they'll be all gone. Uh, all the nativity plays are place. all... Well, well, the the all dads again. and grannies and grandas yeah. and all yeah. that will be missing out and all that too. Again, just, you know. and, uh, but I mean, when we were sitting here a year ago just looking at Christmas, we didn't have a podcast at the time, but we were just hoping that things would be quite quite okay come the spring. Mm. We're still not in the midst of that Ferrari that developed in probably in, in, into the second week of December when mm. numbers began to multiply alarmingly and Christmas was literally cancelled from a social point of view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, here we are a, a year down the road and we have this new variant. And let us hope that those who are vaccinated and those who will have their triple vaccination eh, will still be safe enough even though they might catch it. Yeah. That the vaccination, that message is not, can, can never be overemphasised. A vaccination is there for a purpose, and that's to minimise the impact of of the of the, of the COVID. Should uh, should you get it? But anyway, we're going to move on because we look at a few other different things in, in this week's paper. Of course, we're going to come back to this full make it redress thing, which is another mystery. Uh, you have been talking to John Devaney, the principal of Kilmacrain National School, Eamon. Yeah, I just had a chat with John yesterday. Called over to the to the school. Uh, 
and as we were chatting, you know, the school was <laughs> well ventilated now. They're lucky to have a nice modern school there. That you were, know, you, were you cold? Yeah, well, I was only in for a short time and I didn't get a chance to take my jacket off, but got a good welcome in there anyway. And it wasn't really on school business that we were there. It was on to have a chat with uh, John about his new book. It's a beautifully uh, new hardback book called Counting on a Golf Through the Ages. Um, a book that he's, he's published and, and Penn been working on for many, many years. But he actually said it was during the lockdown that he got the chance to compile all these stories. And they're all very digestible stories. Um, you know, nothing is too uh, drawn out, but he covers a huge span going back to the, you know, going back to the sort of the, the earliest times of, you know, and mm-hmm. he, he has it broken down to chapters all the way through the different periods, right into our kind of more recent history of the, the formation of the republic and right right up into the, like the, the arms tribunals and that but it's a really it's a, a like a potted history of the county if you like really well illustrated with um with plenty of pictures and maps and all the wee reference things that would be make a nice compendium for it so mm-hmm. nice a nice thing for christmas he's going to launch that now on saturday evening in the silver tassie at seven o'clock and i know he said that everybody is welcome to be there they're going to have it all mm-hmm. socially distanced and all that mm-hmm. kind of crack as well so well, we wish that every success. Mm. John is a fine character. Mm. I would normally meet him on the first night of the Letterkenny pantomime, when the uh, when Kilmacrean School were where 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 the guest show or mm-hmm. where, where, where the guests and that they sold the tickets. It would, one, it would always be one of the big big nights of the pantomime season. Mm. Sadly, we're missing again that this year. Yeah, but anyway, we wish John every success right, with that book. book, and let's hope the the launch goes very well for him. From that, Declan, we're going to talk a bit about the success of the Downey's GA team. Yeah. They, that they're through to an, all out, to a, an Ulster semi-final. An Ulster semi-final. Ulster semi-final. Yeah, fresh after the success of their county title one, they had a they had a one up in County Down, up at Park es- Escalier last Sunday, uh, beating the Down champions there by 11 points to 7. And now they're looking forward now to an Ulster semi-final uh, against Sean McDermott from Monaghan on the weekend after next and now they're the only senior men's team from the county still in the Ulster uh, Championship after St. Eunan's exit and Clochanelli's Cl- exit. So, listen, uh, a good result and a good performance up in Newry. And I suppose Hugo McLafferty, the secretary, is telling me that they're just waiting now on the date, either the Saturday or Sunday week now, for that semi-final. And uh, it'll be a, it'll be a tough game against uh, the the Monaghan champions who are who are a good side but it's good to be at that we stage. We bit of momentum behind them maybe. There is, there is, yeah. Yeah, a team will always build that bit of momentum, you know, to get into a a, yeah. a semi final at at at, uh, at a provincial level. And, and no doubt Kevin so could, noteworthy. No no doubt the manager Kevin Cookie Geller and his backroom team will be doing a bit of research on the opposition as well and uh, we wish them well uh, when that game comes around on the weekend after next. I think they've actually got got hold of the of the video of the Sean McDermott victory, as far as they would do, they would do that. That would be, yeah, they'd but be keen. Maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to know that, but anyway, uh, we're still staying in that Downing area, Eamon, with the next story. Uh, ah, yeah, that's it now. Katrina's hair salon marks 30 years in Carrigart. That's uh, uh, Katrina Frail and Nee Shevlin, uh, from well known family down there. Um, she's marked three decades running her own hairdressing salon there, which is. Mm remarkable like you know mm-hmm. she started the business she's only 18 years old and uh that's she was uh, i don't know it pains to make sure i got the age right there that she <laughs> so she but she's built that up you know uh, to become like you know a really strong independent local business there mm-hmm. now and mm-hmm. she even has her own uh, premises and all like that so uh, 30 years for any business yeah you know, it's it a very is. very fine achievement you know, for her but that, like uh, i suppose downings like it's a Gilded Village. It's, it's not that. It's not that busy at this day of the year like everywhere no, else. Well, she will have her hard yeah, well, customers. She, she will have a lot of loyal. No, she she said she would have liked to have, have been able to have a, a proper wee get together a party mm-hmm. something to mark them thirty years. But actually, she of her own batch, she's choosing to uh, make a, a, a charitable donation actually to some local cause, which she hasn't quite determined yet. But that'll be in the next couple of weeks, and we'll find out more about that. But her business has been there. She she even has her own. She rented a property in the first part and she ended up uh, building her own premises. But you can read more about that and that there and there's some nice pictures to go with it as well. So well done to And Katrina. we'll go to another amazing achievement then. Eamon Harkin, the corruptist Declan, has been serving the people of Remelton community yeah, for 50 years. 50 years and wow. uh, he was honoured there in the with a presentation there during the week. So yeah, 50 years. He started there in 71 as he's, his first place was the Robertson School and then 
and then the uh, Remelton Nursing Home, and in more recent times he's been at the McKimmy Hall, and of course Eamon Harkin needs no introduction in terms of chiropathy service provided in Letterkenny uh, for many, many, many years, a native of Convoy, and uh, 50 years, uh, it's a remarkable uh, length of time to be providing a service in any in any one area. And, and I had know. occasion to talk with him yesterday evening, you know, when he could write the history of Remelton. We were just talking about Rose Dibber, whom we featured last week. She's 100 now this coming week. And uh, Eamon recalls her when he came to Remelton. Her mum used to come up to mm-hmm. see him. Mm-hmm. You know, and he had all of those great an- characters and anecdotes, all this. you know, the, mm. the great, great characters, you know, mm. uh, Miss Hunter and Miss, Mrs. Caterson and all of these people. And he had n- not only knew them, but he knew the background of their parentage and all this kind of thing. Uh, and he has retained all that yeah, data. Wealth to, and knowledge there. Right? Wealth and knowledge. It's a great, inter- great interest in people in, in, you know, in, their, in their backgrounds and their history and all that. He's, you know, and I suppose that, that was a, a, a great big part of his life along, alongside his work. Uh, well, I suppose made, you built up a huge uh, amount of information mm-hmm. talking to people when you were taking a taking time to examine their nails and mm-hmm. do the various jobs that you do on feet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, well done, Eamon, and well done to the community in Ramelton. Uh, and grace the, w- grace the wife and the daughter Granny were there too for that presentation. And of course, the presentation was made by Chris Bryant and Anthony McCall, who are, who are really very much involved in the community here now. Mm-hmm. So that is that there. We're going to go back to the front page, full micro redress. The Tribune is saying it's far short of 100%. Let's talk around that to see where we are here because we're looking at a at a at a, an analysis uh, which shows that people with a house of say two and a half thousand square feet mm-hmm. would be out of pocket by seventy thousand, and that's before you that before you factor in additional costs that would become yeah. involved there, demolition like essential services, sort of mm-hmm. yeah. demolition yeah. Re- and removal of materials. Uh, yeah. Getting electricity removed, and reconnected, reconnected yes. water servers, all this kind of thing. Those additional costs, we don't know where we stand on that, but the whole issue around this seems to be hugely confusing. There's a lot of anger and a lot of disappointment. Yeah. But the Minister had a long, long time to deal with this. Yeah. Um, the indications would seem to suggest that, the, that this was changed at the last minute. The by sliding the, scale. By the permanent government, because mm. apparently this, there were some, from what I gather from sources there was some discussion around the early days of the uh of the committee in and uh, and and their meetings with officials in the department where the officials were, were were advocating a sliding scale and that was because the Mike Axe group saw the pitfalls in that mm. and saw the saw the the, the the reality here that this could could be and would be uh a no go it be a no go area because it was not going to address the, the issues that were highlighted when the last scheme was shown to fail, mm-hmm. uh, the four hundred and twenty thousand euro cap, according to Michael Doherty of the P the PRO of the Mike Action Group, is a smokescreen. Mm-hmm. Very very few people will be anywhere near mm-hmm. in line of that there. Mm-hmm. But we're looking here that once you go to three thousand seven hundred square feet of a house, are you listening, Frank McBrady? You're excluded because uh, it doesn't go beyond three thousand seven hundred. Yeah. So those who are at yeah. that level, and there will be some, uh, because yeah. in the greater order of things, many people have houses that big, they will stand to lose a minimum of a hundred and thirty thousand. They'll, yeah, yeah, they'll get four hundred and fifteen, or four hundred and twenty-five. I think. Hmm. Is the read this? Uh, but it's going to cost five hundred and fifty-five thousand. Yeah. But on the standard house of twenty-five, twenty-six hundred square feet, you're talking seventy-five. Mm. Seventy thousand up to eighty thousand, and at the very minimum, way way down at the at the absolute minimum of a one thousand square feet, you're still you're still out of pocket. Mm. So there is no full redress here. But I mean, the strange thing is here that Charlie McConnell Logan is he's the only Donegal TD to have heaped praise on the redress scheme, and he's described it as a tremendous outcome for the homeowners. Now Joe McHugh has said that he will not stand over this uh, sliding scheme. Uh, Patrick McLaughlin takes the same point of view, but I mean, the Mike Action Group are advising people not to sign up to yeah. it. And Paddy Dover and people like that have been out there in front. They know what that they've been delivered a deal that's that's not affordable for a, the vast majority of people mm. now. So you have to ask, where is this going wrong? Why has it gone wrong? And why has it taken so long? And the other question that I would pose is, 
given that even if the, if, if the officialdom got their way in this year, and we always look here uh, a bit beyond the, the, the actual officials they're dealing with on the day, the, uh, the, finance, the finance department, the Minister of Finance and his officials, they will have a big say here. Yeah. I mean, it was supposed to be 3.2 million, where it was a figure that was bandied about. Mm. It's now 2.2. Yeah. It's an increase of 800 million. Now, if you factor in the huge increases since, since, that, since, since that first scheme was advocated, a big amount of that eight hundred million will have been well skinned out of it, both the increase in costs mm -hmm. because prices have gone literally through the roof. Building cost materials. Building cost materials. But the question now is, where does all this go from here? Do they do they go back to the streets, John? Is it, is this the thing? Is it does it does it get that into that zone? Do the government think they've done enough to kind of placate that? You know, they I don't. They don't. They, well, they, they, it's very clear today that they haven't done that. So, what it's, I suppose it's the, uh, the make action group themselves now. What, how What's they the response, eh? how they respond. I mean, Paddy Dever said that the sliding scale has to go before Christmas. Listen, it's, uh, we just don't know where it's Joe going. Joe McHugh was on the Clare Burn show today, amongst other things, and it was interesting. Uh, he's standing over the fact that that's it's, it's, it's a scheme as it stands is not a, it's not affordable, it's not workable, mm. and the sliding scale. The bottom line for them is that this that the sliding scale must go because I mean whoever came up with an idea that four hundred and twenty thousand, uh, first of all, the cap doesn't seem to be right anyway. Yeah. Uh, and that it excludes too many people. Secondly, to put another cap then on the first thousand square feet at one four five, uh, and then all of a sudden, the next thousand feet is a, is a, it's at one ten. Mm. You know, and how they're working on the that? they're working on the basis of a, like a, a, a proposal of of, of one fifty per square foot, wasn't that? That's what they well, were seeking. This so, is what the council is working on at the moment. Uh, and that's and going then, to be re reassessed anyway. I but understand. you see. The, the nonsense that's been come up with today that this will be revisited and readjusted come February or come mm. April, depending who you're listening to. The reality is that it's only the sliding scale is going to be adjusted to meet with the current costs. You're not going to be any worse or any better off as a consequence yeah. of it. Like let's put that yeah. let's nail that mm. one down. Because uh, I think I think the if the government thought that they were selling this deal to the make owners and that it was dressed up in, in fluffy language, a uh, they failed. They failed very badly, mm -hmm. and they've let down the people of Donegal. But most importantly, they've let down the make of homeowners. So it's back to the drawing board, really, as I, as I can see. Like, yeah, the, I mean, the charter surveyors of Ireland. Yeah. So they don't work on any split scales or or sliding scales. It's it's across. Yeah, it's, it's across. The, it's across. A, it's the real and cost. And when they put in an evaluation, it's it's one hundred and forty five for the whole for the yeah. two thousand four hundred or the two thousand five hundred whatever mm. square feet it has. So, uh, listen that. That was thrown in there at the eleventh hour just to reduce. Well, I can accept that. And it I doesn't get cheaper that. to build a house as you're halfway through it. That's for but sure. See, I think it's more. The bit that I would have to query, and will query, is this here. That had to be well known to, at the cabinet table yesterday morning, which was Tuesday, when when Darrell O'Brien brought it in there. Hmm. It was well. It was probably well uh, hyped up the night before, because the level of. Uh, Congratulations and all of that that was coming out from government sources all day yesterday was was really embarrassing mm. because already people down here who had done a bit of an analysis on it saw very clearly that this wasn't what what yeah. they were being led to believe mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that I managed to get through cabinet who should have been seeing all the red flags mm. that raises further questions as about the integrity of the scheme mm. and indeed uh, of how it has been managed first of all so. Uh, it's been delayed for month after month after month and we were one false dawn after the other. So here we are back at the drawing board, right in the middle of winter, right in the worst of the bad weather. And I've talked to people today who are really scared to be living in the house that they're in. Mm -hmm. But they, they have no confidence in this scheme delivering anything for them because they simply can't afford it because they're already stuck with a family starting to grow up into their teenage years and all that the cost that's involved with that, but they're also stuck with a big mortgage mm -hmm. and they don't have, you like, they just don't have any money. No. But anyway, that is for another day. We'll probably come back and revisit that next week. And until then, thanks for listening. And don't forget to buy the Tribune.